Hi, this is Brian Forrester and welcome to another one of my videos. Here we are walking the streets of Glastonbury in England, which is in Somerset, and we're going to be exploring a number of ancient sites, including Stonehenge, Silbury Hill, the Avebury Complex, etc. All locations which have great historical value. Now, this little town is very ancient. It goes back to Neolithic times and has such things as the Chalice Well, which is an ancient sacred well with lots of iron oxide in it, or at least iron in it, so it's of a reddish color. And it has been used by people for healing and uh, meditation and other things for likely thousands of years. This is also the location where supposedly King Arthur and Queen Guinevere were buried. So most of this will be a walking tour. Here you see that this ancient uh, well is still running. This is not the Chalice Well, it's another one across the street called the White Spring. And uh, this area is very much a one would call it like a new age town, but we're not concerned with that as much as we are with the historical aspects such as this, the Glastonbury Tor, which is a man-made hill, most likely, and on top of it are the ruins of St. Michael's Church, which was replaced um, several hundred years ago by what you see now. Uh, prior to that, it was a wooden church, which suffered from an earthquake. And this as well, it's an iconic location. You can see Glastonbury Tor from at least 20 miles away. And supposedly it's also a location which is in uh, the Arthurian legends, as in the legends of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. And it's just an iconic location in southern England. Now here we're taking the hike up to the top of Glastonbury Tor. You can see the shaping of it is obviously uh, an alteration done by human beings in the way distant past. This location or this area also features heavily in um, Supposedly, uh, Joseph of Arimathea, uh, some legends say that uh, Mary, as in the mother of, of Jesus, visited this location. And you can see just the landscape is absolutely breathtaking and beautiful. Again, County Somerset in southern England. Now, England tends to have pretty awful weather, but this location... Uh, was beautiful on this day and of course southern England has a much milder climate than northern England because we had just previously visited Yorkshire in the north there the weather was pretty god-awful but here quite pristine quite beautiful on this September day in 2018 so I've also heard when I was or I did hear when I was there that there are tunnels underneath Glastonbury Tor, there are caves, other stories about treasure that's been um, hidden there in different locations. So it's a very mystical place, a very energetic place in terms of spirituality. And I guess that's why in modern times, it's a Mecca for so-called New Age people to, uh, to live there for extended periods of time. So the church itself, as you can see, is it's likely only a few hundred years old. Uh, it actually has no roof, so the rain goes right through it. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to walk right through the location. Again, the beautiful hillside of England in the background stretching out. And this location, or this area, is also called Avalon. Of course, that comes from the Arthurian times, and 
It's also called the Isle of Avalon because supposedly when King Arthur was alive, this area contained or like a, a large system of lakes. We've now changed location and we're actually at Glastonbury Abbey. So we're walking through here. The Abbey was destroyed supposedly by King Henry VIII. And so we're going to look at some of the details of this, again, iconic location in ancient England. Here you can see what's called the Lady Chapel, Galilean Crypt. So again, connection supposedly with biblical figures after the death of Jesus. And now we're taking a walk through the grounds. And more specifically, we're going to look at a sign which is quite intriguing. Site of the ancient graveyard where in 1191 the monks dug to find the tombs of Arthur and Guinevere. We're now continuing our stroll through the Abbey area. It's quite a large complex. And now, just for kind of the fun of it, because it is in this area, we're going to walk into the abbot's kitchen. And you can see what a kitchen looked like during most likely medieval or even earlier times. So you can hear, actually you can't hear, but you can see that this is the abbot's kitchen. And notice all of the pottery. Some are uh, replicas, some may actually be original artifacts. And it's actually quite a huge kitchen. Here you can see on the left some of the preserved foods. Then you have the place where water and soups were made. And there, pigs and chickens being roasted. But now the main feature of this video for most of you is Stonehenge. And what we're going to hear is we're going to hear the words of local expert Maria Wheatley, who lives in the area and has been studying Stonehenge for at least 30 years. Her father before her. She is a dowser, as was her father, and she has written extensively and studied extensively Stonehenge and Avebury and other megalithic structures in the area. So now you see you're on the axis line, you're with the heel stone, there's the swallows, and there was three standing stones just in front of the entrance, uh -huh. which would have blocked off your view. Oh. You wouldn't again be able to see what was happening in this side. Uh -huh. So that's the axis line of the moon and the sun, and this is the actual entrance. And it's very subtle because it's just a little bit wider than the spacing of the other stones. Uh -huh. So this is the, the official way into Stonehenge rather than <laughs> oh. uh, through there. And these are the Sarsen stones. Mm -hmm. And then when you walk through here, this is the blue stones now. Oh. So these are from the Priscelli and you find this shape all over Europe. 
and this is considered a feminine stone because of its shape. Uh -huh. And the, this stone here is considered masculine. But they've lost their, their luster because um, this is blue stone, and when it's highly polished, it looks like that. Really? And that's sarsen. So that's what you're seeing. Highly polished sarsen behind you would have looked like that originally. Uh -huh. And that would have been the blue stones. That's the drama of colour change here uh -huh. that you just can't see uh, today. And the altar stone, we'll just go through this axis line here. Sure. We've got a blue stone circle around here, mm -hmm. of which this is a part. And the diameter is uh, 79 feet. 20 inches, according to John Michel, very famous author, uh -huh. the late John Michel. And he reckons if you multiply that by 100 and change it to miles, you get the diameter of the earth <coughs> coded into Stonehenge. Wow. So again, it would look very beautiful. And then as we approach the altar stone. Thank you. Now this originally stood as the first phase of Stonehenge, 16 feet high, but today it doesn't look much. But again, once we look at the colour coding, this was green, highly polished, flexed with garnet. Really? So it would have looked completely different to what it does today. Uh -huh. And that's the greater Trilithon, and this yeah. part fell, and this was the top capstone on top of it. But this is what foxes a lot of people. There's its socket, can you see there? Yeah. Which would have fitted into the tenon up there. But if we go around the other side, uh -huh. It's also got two more sockets on this side, uh -huh. as if we've got another stone on the top. But what the official explanation is, is that this side was wrong and the other side was right. <coughs> okay. Now, this stone here has got a big groove down it. This is the tallest blue stone at Stonehenge, and it's got a clear groove. Uh -huh. It once had a partner that had a kind of a socket going into it, causing a big block of here because it didn't fit into the Stonehenge model of Richard Atkinson of having you know 19 stones he buried it just here so anything that doesn't fit into the model of Stonehenge is actually buried whoa amazing and the, this is the kind of horseshoe of uh, five big uh, quite weathered uh -huh. uh, stones and again where this where the stones from the Sarsen stone here is from the Marlborough Downs near Avery, which is about 70 to 20 miles uh, north of here. Uh -huh. And this stone here, the Priscelli Blue Stone, comes from Wales, about 170 miles away. But the analysis by Rob Ixer of uh, an archaeologist that's looking into the geology of uh, Stonehenge now thinks they come from North Wales, which is even further away. So they've just found some new outcrops of what's called the Blue Stone. So that's these ones would have looked more silver on the outside, uh -huh. and some of them would have looked cr more cream against the blue and the you know the, the drama of the coloring of the uh, altar stone. Uh -huh. And there's another uh, entrance into Stonehenge just over there. It's called the Southern Entrance, and uh, not a lot of people talk about that. They just talk about the main entrance there. And there, there's, this is a, a good story of Stonehenge that is not in any guidebook what, uh -huh. whatsoever. When Richard Atkinson came here, some of the stones were leaning. Okay, so he felt that all of them should be perpendicular, just stood, stood upright. So he came to this stone here. It was leaning. You always get leaning stones at ancient sites in Northwest Europe. It's like bowing to sacred space. So he got the crane and he started to move it upright. But then it let off a scream, uh, according to the creator. A crack came in it there. So he had to concrete it all here. He broke the stone. I'm sorry about the low quality of the audio when Maria speaks, but the problem is that the wind was blowing literally at least 50 miles an hour and so I've tried my best to uh, reduce the background sound etc um, but she does have priceless things to say she's way more informative and informed than I am 
I've only been there three times. She's probably been to Stonehenge a hundred times. So let's continue on with what Maria has to say. Back in the day, uh, it would be completely blocked off. You would be able to see what was going on inside Stonehenge now. The banks would have been very high. The three stones are blocking your view. And if you're an outsider, you just see those top lintel bits. Ah. So yeah, this was phase one Stonehenge, so this predates what you're seeing behind you by about 500 years. Oh really? And again, it's leaning. Uh -huh. It's very important you'll notice that at A3, you'll notice that at all stone circles uh, of the British Isles, you will have uh, a leaning one, even in Sardinia and places uh, I've noticed. Uh -huh. And they've, they've actually put down, this is a new addition, the axis line. Can you see how it's a bit off? For right the, for the sunrise and sunset uh -huh. and the moon one would literally have been down here like this so that's the angle of it that's what i mean atkinson kind of fates it uh -huh. really about this so this is really a, a lunar stone uh -huh. it's about 16 uh, tons comes from the uh, marlborough dance bear in mind that the, the long skull people that put this up they moved the largest and heaviest amounts of stone because that is, uh, when we come to the Avery environs, for example, they were the ones moving the heaviest stone, ah. not the later Bronze Age people. Oh, really? Yeah. So the older monuments are heavier than the, the, the more recent ones. So what Maria is saying is that the outer circle, because she believes that originally Stonehenge was two circles, and the smaller stones were in the inner circle, the larger stones in the outer circle. That um, she believes that the dating originally goes back to about 12,000 years, whereas conventional academics say somewhat around 4,500 years. Official carbon 14 testing of bits of wood found underneath uh, the Stonehenge area. They say dated to 4,500 years, but according to researcher John Cowie, who did independent study, the dating should go back to more like 12,000 years. So the present state of Stonehenge is not what it originally was. And just for fun, this is what's called Woodhenge, which is in the area. Originally, of course, these little pillars would have been taller and would have been wooden, but they rotted away a long time ago and have been replaced by these concrete columns. Again, she dates Woodhenge has been contemporary with Stonehenge at 12,000 years old. And now we're at Avebury, which is one of the largest megalithic complexes in the world. Whereas the stones of Stonehenge uh, come from, I believe, the Marlborough area as well as possibly northern uh, Wales. The quarry, according to Maria, of these stones at Avebury are from a, a quarry about th three miles or 4.5 kilometers away. And I asked her also what type of stone it is, and she stated that it's called sarsen stone. And as we look very, very carefully, after we look at the ditch, which is ancient and surrounds much of Avery, we'll see that the stone is of a very fine grain. And I believe it's a type of quartzite. So it's very high in quartz crystal content, which could very well mean that it was energetic in nature. What she's pointing out now is that there are female stones and male stones. This is a female stone because it's wider at the top than the bottom. And then the male stones, of course, are the opposite. <clears throat> and here we see evidence 
of where the stones uh, themselves have been quarried over the course of time by local farmers and other people, uh, damaging some of them and in other cases breaking them down into small bits to be used in the construction of walls. So when we see that there is damage to um, megalithic sites in many parts of the world as the result of warfare, invading armies, um, other belief systems that take over older belief systems. In this case, it appears that it was local farmers destroying and damaging the stones for building material. And again, that's happened in Egypt, in Peru, in Bolivia, etc. So we've just walked through to another section because again, Avebury is <clears throat> excuse me, one of the largest megalithic sites on Earth. Some of the stones weigh up to a hundred tons. And as we walk along, we'll see that Avebury just keeps going and going and going. The great thing about Avebury is that you're allowed to touch the stones where at um, Stonehenge you're not allowed to. If we kind of go over here and you look at the stone at this angle, you can see like a face profile. Mm -hmm. Well, if you look really carefully at this face profile, I think it was all highly polished sarsen because come and have a look at this. That's very smooth, polished off sarsen. Oh, yeah. Feel it. So I think the whole of the face was polished off. That's how smooth Stonehenge would have been. Oh, really? So now Maria is showing us a drawing of what Silbury Hill may have originally looked like. And we're going to be seeing Silbury Hill in this video. But for now, it's more exploration of the Avebury megalithic complex, which again is absolutely vast in scale. And supposedly some studies have been done, I'm not sure what science was used, to measure the energy that is actually present in the stone. And the Avebury World Heritage Site is a huge complex of Silbury Hill, Avebury Stone Circles, the Sanctuary, etc. And now we are at Silbury Hill. And here again, Maria has some insights that she wants to share with us. This definitely is not a natural hill, or at least is, has been heavily modified over the course of centuries, if not millennia. Mars there and Marden was a super huge complex in between uh, Stonehenge and Avebury. And Den is an old English word for settler, and that means the settlement of Mars. Okay? Now, I showed that to Rodney Hale, who I was mentioning earlier, that's worked with uh, Andrew Collins. And, um, we notice that if you use Silvery Hill for Earth, and then you go to Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and so on, they're using the mean distance in the heavens of where Earth is to all the ancient sites. And the ancients chose the orbit of Neptune, the god of the seas, right on the coast of an ancient settlement looking, uh, looking down. Wow. So that's laid out as a planetarium. So I said to Rodney, when in time, did the planets start to really line up symbolically to represent the day line. And he got 2,746 BC, which is the heyday of Stonehenge. Or Stonehenge is much older, and that was a kind of like huge planetary line that people gathered for at Stonehenge uh, to celebrate. So this is the standard description of how Silbury Hill was made, which is quite ludicrous that a bunch of people with skin or cloth bags uh, filling up with material were able to create this giant mound. Also, it appears to be made of chalk and there was a sacred lake once located here. Again, Silbury Hill is several thousands of years old and probably was altered over the course of time depending upon who was living in the area. But you see it's relatively even in terms of shape and size, so the idea that it's natural is highly unlikely. And again, more of the Avebury World Heritage Site, Windmill Hill, etc. 
So England has many, many, many ancient sites that are great to look at. Of course, the most famous would be Stonehenge, but Silbury Hill is quite fascinating. And this is our final destination that we're going to be visiting, and that's West Kennet Long Barrow. And the intriguing thing about this location is that it was an ancient cemetery and Maria is going to give us some incredible insights as regards its age and the fact that two, at least two different ancient cultures existed here. First, it was an elongated skull culture and then they were destroyed by what are called the Beaker people who arrived somewhere in the area of 4,500 years old. So once again, we have those interesting two dates, one of 4,500 years ago and the other of 12,000 years ago. Most of you, I'm sure, have never heard the idea that elongated skulls have been found here, but elongated skulls have been found in the long barrows and normal skulls are found in round barrows. But let's let Maria give us insight. Neolithic the long skull period. This was open and aligned to face the full moon in the east and the spring and autumn equinox sunrise. Uh -huh. Okay. Now they used the chambers for probably initiation, rituals, ceremony, not for death. Uh -huh. Okay. And then when it came to their final demise and the long skull people were attacked many murdered around Stonehenge. There was a decommissioning phase of the Neolithic. What do I mean by that, the decommissioning phase? What they did, uh, the round skull people, the beaker culture, they got dirt and they got everything associated with that civilization, put their skulls and their long bones inside, infilled this with dirt, massive blocking stone here. Put the skulls in, massive blocking stone and did that throughout this, and then in the style of Indiana Jones, <laughs> they got this blocking stone and sealed the tombs for all time. Wow. I know, it's uh, archaeologists don't talk about that fence. Uh -huh. In fact, I'm the only Earth Mysteries person that ever pointed that out. This is the long lost, forgotten history of the early Neolithic civilization. So when, when would this have uh, taken place where the Round skull people took over and well, Brian, it's that date everybody bangs on about 2500 BC. I actually think it was a lot earlier than that. Uh huh. Yeah, but that's the archaeological date given through some shards that they found in there. And it wasn't until the 1950s that they realised there was these chambers here because it was so infilled with dirt, so jam packed that the archaeological team had to hire huge diggers to get all of it out but that didn't just happen in this area that happened throughout the british isles uh -huh. so it was a phase where let's forget about the past let's forget about these people even existed and we'll start building our own culture so they added to the monuments that the long skull people had already erected is my theory mm -hmm. and it's archaeologically correct so these are the celts who moved in and you know, the Beaker people, Be the, the, Beaker, people. the Beaker people were going across uh, Europe from probably from pockets in Russia, uh, the steppes there, and they were moving across Europe with a culture called the Beaker culture, which was urn burials in beakers. Mm -hmm. They were a lot taller than the uh, ancient Britons, and they were fairer in, uh -huh. in skin oh. uh, and color, and they came and either brought disease here, killed a lot of people. There was a crisis point in the Neolithic and no other Neolithic monument was ever built after 2500 BC. Oh, wow. So it's, uh, which I point out in my little book, I mean, I'm writing a bigger book on Stonehenge and the Long Skull people, but I point that out, I'll give you a couple of copies of that, which I've got, to describe all of this and the, the de decommissioning of their monuments. I mean, Stonehenge was twice as violent. Mm -hmm. They really put more rubble in so packed and started to destroy the frontispieces. pieces. They didn't just get the block and stone and neatly put it in. Uh, and some of the um, skulls were really in a bad state in Stonehenge because they'd been crushed uh -huh. with the weight of the decommissioning phase. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was 
these are the actual chambers. And you get this throughout Ireland in the British Isles. The top stone here always has this kind of rubble effect. You, you find that in Ireland, you, you find it in some parts of Sardinia, uh -huh. actually, and, uh, and Malta. So that's uh, a very Neolithic feature. Hmm. And same with this one here. I mean, obviously, that's more concrete from Atkinson's time. And you have that there. So these were the chambers, but the, the far chamber, which now, have you got two, two smaller chambers there? That's a block and stone there, you see. Mm -hmm. And this is the, the bar. Chamber, but originally it was what's called corbelled roofing, mm -hmm. and that's where you get a dome effect. Uh, like mm -hmm. at Newgrange, uh, Maze Howe in Orkney. So, Lording Corbel, dry stone corbel effect, uh, coming up, and uh, that in itself generates a particular type of, uh, of energy. 